Welcome, welcome, welcome to The Living Room, where we listen, learn, and live together. I'm your host, Richard Martin. I'm glad you're here. Make yourself right at home. Well, today I want to talk a little bit about milestones, those things that mark the progression of life. We have moved along in 2021, haven't you? At the time of this recording, it is March the 8th, 2021. It seems like we were just bidding one another Happy New Year. Like you, I also hope that 2021 would be drastically different than 2020, especially as it relates to COVID-19. And whereas there's been some change, some progress, as it were, a lot of things are still the same. And yet, as I look back over this year, there are milestones that I would like to comment on with you. And I want to ask you, what milestones have you experienced over the past year? What God markers, as my wife and I call them, do you have in your file of experience? What's going on in your life right now? Well, most immediately, as I am speaking with you, the sun is shining brightly outside. We're getting hints of spring that is forthcoming. And in the words of Al Roker, what's going on in your neck of the woods? I know I changed it. He would say, here's what's happening in your neck of the woods. Well, I want to ask you what's going on in your neck of the woods. If you've been tracking with us over the past several months here in the living room, I want to thank you. Thank you for liking, commenting, and sharing our inspiring conversations. And if you've not done so already, I would greatly appreciate it if you would subscribe to the channel so that others have the opportunity to hop on in, make themselves at home, and listen as we learn together. So milestones, those things that mark the progression of life, we pursue them, uh, we achieve many of them, and when we do, we pause to reflect often in celebration and gratitude. I had one such moment a few days ago when I was able to drive with my wife on Highway 64 going west, and on the highway, we experienced together a milestone. What are you talking about, Rich? Well, my car, 2004 Toyota Corolla, was gifted to me in 2007. It was one of my parents' high school graduation gifts to me a gift to me upon the occasion of my high school graduation. Like many teenagers, I'd been asking them for a number of things in preparation for college, and one of them, you know, was a, was a car. Please, mom and dad, I, I would love to have a car to go to college. I think I caught that because that, that desire, that is, from friends whose parents had either promised them or uh, kind of hinted at the fact that they would receive a car if they achieved a certain grade point average or if they received a certain amount of funds in scholarship, in scholarships. And uh, I thought that, listen, if I can kind of argue my way in with my parents and they too would be willing to give me a car. And they said no repeatedly throughout my entire junior and senior year. No, son, we're not going to be able to do that. We were going to be investing our funds and resources into your collegiate education. We don't have time to get you a car. Well, it was on May 27th, 2007, a wonderful graduation weekend, the Friday evening consecration service, the Saturday baccalaureate service, and then Sunday morning was the commencement service. And at the conclusion of it, as we were walking out, it was done. Our tassels had gone to the other side of the motorboard. My dad gifts me a box, which was empty. When I unwrapped the box, or rather when I pulled it out of the gift bag, it was a box that indicated that what used to be in it was a car alarm. I thought that this was some kind of symbol that, hey, keep this, hold on to it as an investment, as it were, a symbolic investment in the potential, future potential for you to get a car. Whether or not it was going to be by way of my own working and gaining funds to get it or whether they were going to gift it to me in the future, I didn't know. But I can remember my emotional response in that moment was, oh, thank you so much. You know, I've been asking for an actual car, but I get it. You gave me this empty car alarm box just to keep and hold and to look forward to receiving a car. So when I looked up from the box, my dad is standing in front of me with keys in his hand and he has a big fatherly smile on his face. And my mom is positioned just a little bit behind him. And she has that mother's look of, of admiration and, and, and pride as well on her face. And I said, dad, no way. Nuh-uh. You can't be serious. And he handed me the keys to the car with a key fob on there. And he said, go find your car. 
So the alarm box was empty because they had an alarm actually put into the vehicle. And I'm walking around campus literally yelling with, with joy and, and exclamation. And I'm pressing the key fob and I'm pressing the alarm button trying to hear what's going on. And it was on the other side of campus. And there I feasted my eyes on an all black 2004 Toyota Corolla. It was and is one of the best days of my life. Oh man, I mean, we drove it from, I was uh, graduated from a boarding school in Pennsylvania, graduated from there. We drove it from there back to Ohio where my family was living at the time. And since then I've had many wonderful experiences with that car. I wasn't able to take it to college the first semester, but they were kind enough to let me take it the second semester. And I had it there throughout my collegiate experience. This 2004 Toyota Corolla upon me receiving it had just over 30,000 miles on it. Prior to us receiving it, it had only been owned by one owner. And I believe it was an older person or older couple. My memory doesn't serve me well in that regard, but they didn't drive it much on average of 10,000 miles a year. It was just kind of a here to their vehicle. They weren't going cross country and things like that. So when we received it, it was in tip top shape. I mean, automatic locks and windows, automatic lights. For a 2004 Toyota Corolla, it had a lot going on, especially low mileage, ran smoothly. My parents explained to me that they did not intend to purchase a car. They weren't just putting on airs. They didn't intend to purchase a car for me. But as they explained the story of how they came across this vehicle, where and when they did, and the, the, the price that they were able to secure it for, it was just a testimony in and of itself. So fast forward now with me a few months later when two of the two church mothers that I grew up with or um, that were church mothers at the church where I grew up, they came to Ohio from Florida to visit us and they had learned that my parents gifted me a car. And so the car at the time of their visit was in the garage and I never forget one evening, they wanted to go and see the car in the garage. And these two church mothers who had come to visit us, they began to walk around the car praying for it. Did you hear what I just said? Yes. They walked around the car praying for it. I'm not talking about little, you know, out of the side of your mouth prayers, just sentence prayers or cliche memorized prayers that we all can recite. No, they were praying out loud, touching the car as they walked around it, asking God to protect me as the driver, primary driver of the car, asking God to preserve the car's effectiveness and efficiency for a long period of time. You see, why this is so important to me is because at this time, I was beginning to process what I sensed to be a call to pastoral ministry, a call to be a pastor. And I hadn't shared it with too many people, but my family, immediate family knew it. And either they knew it or they sensed it. Because I remember one line in their prayer that stuck out to me. They said, God, this is your son. He is your servant. He's going to have assignments to go on. And this car is going to be instrumental in getting him there. So we need you to protect him. We need you to preserve the car. Keep those out of the car who don't need to be in it. And only allow persons into the car who do need to be in it. And that was the summer before going to college. And I said quite humorously and facetiously then... I'm going to have this car even when I'm married. I'm going to have this car and I'm going to actually take this car as a part of my a part of my honeymoon. Now, I didn't really believe that. I thought for sure this car would last through college, maybe. And then upon being gainfully employed after school, I would be able to invest in another car. But man, fast forward years later through college, through graduate school. Guess what? I was able to get married and this car still worked. Now, we didn't take it on our honeymoon. We, we flew to our honeymoon destinations and cruised to other honeymoon destinations. But by the time we arrived to our first location where I assumed my first pastoral responsibility, you better believe that this 2004 Toyota Corolla was an integral part and it is still with us. Now the milestone on I-64 West just a few days ago, I saw the numbers on my mile, my mile meter um, um, rising and rising and rising. And I knew any day now I was going to hit a significant milestone. Can you guess which milestone that was? No, 
It wasn't the 100,000 mile milestone. No, it wasn't the 150 mile milestone. You guessed it. Here, just a few days ago, not far from our house, my wife and I were able to go and experience my car, our car, reaching 200,000 miles. Now, the reason why that's so powerful to me is because I remember like it was yesterday. In 2007, two church mothers who are resting now, awaiting the soon return of Jesus Christ, they pray for longevity, for preservation and protection. Let me interject this in there because for a, about a three-year period, my dad worked in Guam, which is a United States territory in the South Pacific Ocean. And this car was shipped out there for him to use. So it was there for three years, made it back, back into my possession. So it's been literally on the contiguous United States and outside of the United States and back. It's been in various states. And here it is now in 2021. I had the chance to literally watch as it clicked 200,000 miles. <laughs> It's amazing to me because not only do I believe that this has a lot to do with, okay, the wonderful manufacturing efficiency and skills of the Toyota manufacturing enterprise. I, I, I believe that has something to do with it. I think Toyotas are great cars, right? I think it has something to do with regular and consistent maintenance, oil changes, engine changes, changing the tire, making sure the car is washed, doing my part to make sure that it runs for a long period of time. I think it has a lot to do with the fact that I've been blessed not to get into any accidents with this car. I've gotten my fair share of tickets. I'm not too proud of that, but it's the truth and the truth shall set you free. But over and beyond maintenance and manufacturing and over and beyond trying to be as safe as possible while driving, I do not want to discount nor depreciate the value of the prayers of two believing women. I don't know what impressed them, what inspired them, what compelled them to pray over for all in, what for all intents and purposes is an inanimate object. I mean, as 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 meaningful as my car is to me, I'm not naive. I understand that that it is not a contemporary iteration of a car that has all the bells and whistles. It has no Bluetooth connection capabilities. There's no computer that that automates its functions. I cannot take my hands off of the wheel and expect it to drive itself. Okay, there's a lot that indicates that it's a 2004 Toyota Corolla. But please believe that, man, that car is able to do things that I would dare say some newer cars aren't able to do. And I appreciate the fact that these two women were obedient enough, were kind enough, were willing enough to, to not think it's strange to walk around a teenager's car and pray for it, pray for me, pray for the journey ahead. When I think of the assignments that I have had the chance to fulfill, and not just preaching, but but and not just not just teaching in a pastoral sense, when I think of how this car was was very integral at points in my collegiate journey of allowing me to assist other friends from just going to Walmart to even taking some friends to the hospitals. Man, I think of the prayers over this car. So that's my 200 200,000 mile milestone that I'm celebrating this week and here is my prayer now. My prayer for the next milestone is 400,000 miles. I know that's a stretch. That's that's a lot. It it took from 2007 to 2021 in order to reach this 200,000 mile milestone. Well, I, I'm glad because that means as we continue to invest in maintenance and as manufacturers investment continues to pay off, and even as the prayers prayed in 2007 continue to yield great dividends, I'm going to start adding prayers now that I will have the chance with my own eyes to see this car, 2004 Toyota Corolla, reach 400,000 miles. Who knows whether or not we'll still have the Living Room Podcast. We might have, <laughs> the, the Living Room Podcast might have produced children by then. And so we might have other podcasts or other shows, maybe even on a wider scale. Who knows? But why not pray 
for those future milestones. Why not pray and hope and dream and plan and reach for and grasp for some 400,000 mile mile markers? A lot will transpire between now and then. And I hope and pray that the car will be preserved, that all of its riders and drivers will be protected. I may be able to gift this, who knows, to my future children. Now, you might be saying, now, Rich, uh uh, <laughs> don't give your future children a 2004 Toyota Corolla. Listen, if they're anything like I was back then, if they'll be anything like me, they'll be glad to receive anything with a steering wheel, four wheels, and some heat and AC. So I don't know. They might have to just roll down the windows in the summer. I'm not sure. But whether or not I gift them a different car, I hope that this car will still be in the family because it in and of itself is a symbol for me of answered prayer. So that's one of my milestones, 200,000 miles. I'm excited. That thing made me smile. In fact, we, we recorded a little video while it was happening. My wife had the phone, so my hands were on the wheel. I was being safe, but I wanted to capture that milestone. It was just for some reason, and I remember hitting the 100,000 mile mark and 150,000 miles, but for some reason, hitting 200,000 miles, it was, it hit differently. Uh, it meant something more. And so I'm looking forward to what the future holds. There's also a one year milestone that I am, I don't know if I want to use the word celebrating, at least I'm thinking about it. And there are some celebration worthy elements to it, um, but, but here it is. A few days ago made one year since the last time I, as well as my church, my church and I held a worship service in our building. It was a year ago this past Saturday. So that this coming weekend will make one complete year since we've been in the building. We, we, we had a worship service a year ago, a few days ago, but this coming weekend will make one year of 52 weekends of not being in our church building. As I was able to coin the phrase, or at least coin the phrase in my own context, the gathered church became the scattered church. Not the first time in church history that has happened but perhaps the most contemporary time where it's happened on such a seismic scale, I mean, global scale, where those who are used to coming together and gathering for worship settings, teaching, meeting sessions, uh, whatever, whatever the community of faith came together to do, that was significantly interrupted, disrupted. And we all, we all over the past year have had to adjust, adapt, and really learn and relearn and reimagine what it means to be church, what it is to do church. And as I've been reflecting on this by myself and also in conversation with peers, those who are pastors and those who are not pastors, uh, there have been some lessons learned, some challenges experienced, and there have also been blessings that I am grateful for. And I just wanted to talk with you about some of them. And again, what has your experience been like? Whether or not you are a person of faith, you know what this past year has meant in every conceivable arena of life, school, politics, healthcare, church, life, family, employment situations, you name it, all of us have in some way, form or fashion, directly and or indirectly, we've been influenced and impacted by this. For some of us, the experience has been relatively light. And then for others of us, it has been unspeakably burdensome. And then there have been various experiences that have kind of put us between those two poles. What was going through my mind a year ago? Well, to be most literal, what wasn't going through my mind a year ago today was that we were about to embark upon a year, at least the year of a very strange and unprecedented season. So, you know, if a year ago today was was Monday, man, I, I wasn't thinking that this was I saw a meme on Instagram recently that said uh, a year ago today. We didn't know a year ago this week was going to be our last normal week. Normal in quotes. Yeah, I didn't know that I was a part of the group that was relatively ignorant as to just the amount of changes that were about to take place. Um, I knew and had heard of the coronavirus, as I'm sure you did. I didn't know all there was to know about it. In fact, several weeks prior to our last weekend of worship in the church building, 
Kyle and I were out in California celebrating our anniversary, having a conversation with a with an immunologist who was kind of giving us the the cliff notes version of what this virus meant, the implications of it for the human population. And we were sitting right next to one another in a restaurant as if it wasn't and it couldn't. There's no way in the world it was going to become the worst case scenario, even though at that time conversations were happening about, well, what do we do if a pandemic spreads across the world and shuts everything down? At that time, it was just a conversation. Had no idea that in less than a month, it was going to be more than conversation. It was going to be reality. And so it went exactly like that. I was actually scheduled to travel from Virginia to Connecticut to speak for a weekend for one of my colleagues in ministry there. And on the Thursday, we began to hear different things from our governing body here in uh, Virginia or in the conference that I work, that that I'm a part of. And they said, well, listen, we're going to have to ask all churches to minimize attendance. So once you receive 50 attendees, then no more people can come in. That was on Thursday. Right. So I'm now starting to reach out to my leadership team and explain that to them. By Friday morning, it was down to 10. And so I'm saying to myself, wait, we can only have 10 persons come to church. So now I'm thinking, oh, 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 let me add this. In addition to that, the guest speaker that was coming to my church to speak, who worked for the government, works for the government, said, listen, my job is saying I can't leave the state to come to where you are because we're now on lockdown. So I said, what do you mean you're on lockdown? Explained it to me. So now I'm going into some real like damage control. I reached out to my minister of music at the time and 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 had him say, listen, we got to plan a worship and music service for those that will come. It's going to be limited capacity and it's going to be a different kind of service. And here are the reasons why. That was Friday morning. It wasn't I don't think we made it past Friday afternoon until I received word that they're saying, listen, close the doors of the church. No churches are open. And all of the information is rolling out that fast. I reached out to my minister of music. I reached out to my church leaders. I said, we got to get the word out expeditiously to let people know that we will not hold service in the church this weekend. Now, this time again, I had no clue what we were on, what we were really getting, what roller coaster we were getting on. I remember having an immediate uh, emergency meeting with my colleagues in this conference. Uh, and by conference, for those who aren't familiar with that term, I'm a part of a, a, a region of, of churches is called a conference stemming from Southern Virginia all the way up to Northern Jersey, the Allegheny East Conference of Seventh-day Adventists. And so we had a meeting, emergency meeting, and they explained to us what we knew and what we didn't know and what we were going to do as we were acquiring more information. And that was the churches would be closed until the end of May. Now, this is the second weekend of March. And now they're saying to the end of May, listen, I said, there's no way in the world we're going to be outside of our church building. That's an overstatement. Why are we exaggerating? Let's take it three, maybe four weeks at a time. But to reach the end of May, hindsight's 2020, not only did we reach the end of May, we reached the end of June and July and August and September. And as we near December, I shook my head saying, we're not going to go back into the building this calendar year. And by that time, I was convinced. I mean, it'd been months. I was clear. We might not even be back at the top of the new year. And so here it is one year later, and we are about to commemorate. And I I hesitate to say celebrate because I know it's not celebratory for everyone, but we're going to commemorate one year of this scattered iteration of church life, or at least an aspect of church life. I have colleagues who almost celebrated with great exuberance and energy that we were outside of the church building saying uh, things and themes of of the nature. Uh, we should we, we should have never been confined to a church building or 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 now finally the church is being pushed out into the streets. It is it is beyond the four walls. Now we have to think creatively and virtually and et cetera, et cetera. And I get their point. I do. I really do. And I'm going to transition in a few seconds here to to the positives, the blessings, the lessons learned. But I will say this. I I had to learn to hesitate to really just ride that train because like anything, infrastructure, buildings, physical plants, they, they do add value. And I should say, in addition to adding value, 
they are a part of the history and the psyche and the meaning of any experience. Take, for instance, this space where I am right now, my living room of our apartment, um, your living room, the vehicle that you might be driving in as you're listening to this, wherever you are, the actual physical surroundings, whereas they are not everything that makes your job, your job, your school, your school, your mode of transportation, what it is, your home, your home. Yes, there's the people element, both inside and outside of this space. My wife is still my wife. But the experiences that we have in a certain space, in a certain location, man, they're meaningful such that if we were because of a flood or some natural natural catastrophe evicted from this place or lost it all, as some of my friends have in California as a result of wildfires and in Texas as a result of this winter freeze, uh, which is uncharacteristic for, for, for Texas, man, you can recognize on an intuitive and logical level, yes, this is not everything, but it is something. And so I, I learned to hesitate to just, or at least not only speak on that end to say, hey, look at what positives are coming out of not being in the church building. Because for many persons, whether it was one year or 20 years in my particular context, man, the experiences, the relationships, the quality encounters with God in that building for some of them, only once a week, it meant the world to them. And so even though you were trying to make a case about the mission still moving forward, I learned to be mindful that in saying that I did not want to unintentionally cause uh, or, or, or exacerbate a sense of grief that people were already experiencing, trying to orient themselves to this new normal, a normal that many were not readily willing to accept, that I did not unintentionally damage anymore by way of trying to point to a positive, I didn't want to do an unintentional or, or, or um, I didn't want to cause an unintentional negative. And so um, we get it. And I agree. The church is not the building. It's not only the building. The church is a body. It's a body of people. It's a living and dynamic organism uh, that God is called to be a representative of his grace, of his love, of his mission in the world. But that is not at the expense of, that is not to say that there is no place in the world for gatherers to come together inside of a building. Can it be limiting? Can it be confining? Do we need to be mindful as we think about what comes next? Yes, we do. Before I get there, let me just say uh, there have been some blessings, though, not just professional either, but personal in this past year as I think about you know, just not knowing what to anticipate, what was going to come of it. And we've seen in society, right, there have been waves for the first several weeks, first few months even, it was shelter in place, lockdown, right? And then there were all of these phased reopenings. We began with masks and shields and gloves and washing your groceries and changing your clothes. You better not come in this house with those same clothes on. Put them in a trash bag and wash them, right? People were hypersensitive. Their practices betrayed that fact. But you can see now, at least where I am, optically speaking, that some of that has changed. I don't see too many people wearing gloves anymore when they grocery shop. And even the hesitation that you once had, you could be on the opposite end of the same aisle. And if you saw someone coming your way, you were going to go the other way, right? I still get a little nervous when people are too close to me and, and they sneeze or cough. And I am self-conscious when I do the same because there's a heightened sensitivity to even those very human things, coughing and sneezing right? I don't know how cautious we are anymore about wiping our eyes and touching our mouths. I hope we still are mindful in washing our hands and using sanitizer. But my point is so much has changed. Indeed, it has. And what's deep to me is this, that through one of the most unprecedented, in many ways, chaotic, definitely mournful years, there are also blessings, lessons. There are also high points, Things that we can point to and say, yes, it was sad. Yes, it's been difficult. Coronavirus is just one reality. I haven't even spoken about um, many nations and countries and the political turmoil that has stemmed from this, that preceded it, but was exacerbated by it. Uh, racial injustice, uh, gender-based violence. I mean, we can go on and on about the atrocities that we just had time to actually give attention to, right? But in the midst of all of that, Man, there were some, some moments that as I look back on, they were milestones in and of themselves. One I'll mention is my wife and I had the chance to, to read through two books that are a part of a series called the Conflict of Ages series. We read Desire of Ages and a book called 
The Great Controversy. Now, those are no small books. Just Google them and you'll see uh, they're pretty hefty. And we had read chapters out of them individually and, and even collectively before, but we just started reading together. And we read Desire of Ages first. And when we came to the end of that, I suggest that we read the Great Controversy. And no, I'm sorry, I flipped it around. We read The Great Controversy first. And then after that, we read The Desire of Ages. Am I getting that right? Either way, we ended up reading both of the books and they too were blessings. Now, one of the reasons why we were able to read them is because we had a different configuration of time. We were spending way more time with one another. I mean, we were accustomed to waking up together, going to sleep together. That The, the bookends of the day were, were what they were, but in between, I didn't have to go out for church meetings. Travel engagements were all canceled or postponed or, or translated into virtual opportunities like yours. And so we wanted to make sure that we were still moving forward and deepening our relationship in different ways. She introduced a new communication pattern or, or excuse me, a new communication practice where each week we would come together and and have three items. It could be three questions, uh, one question, one comment, one word of affirmation, a complaint or something that we were concerned about. And we would come together once a week in exchange. That enhanced our communication. And as a part of our deepening spiritual relationship, um, we wanted to read these books together. And man, that was a milestone for us as individuals and as a couple, a part of our history as a couple. In the context of a global pandemic, no less, we were able to read and not just to acquire information, but it caused us to reflect more importantly on where we were as a couple, where we were in our relationship with the Lord as individuals and where we wanted to go. We have since commenced reading a third book in that series. It's a series of five books called Acts of the Apostles. Now, we're hoping to finish that one. And then we'll go on to the next two, Patriarchs and Prophets and Prophets and Kings. We're definitely going out of order, but the point is these milestones, man, they mean the world. Not only have they been helpful for us spiritually, but I truly believe that because we had something to do every day or every other day that was productive, that was developmental, it allowed us to be able to maintain a level of uh, level-headedness and sanity, and it added to our mental and emotional health because we were able to do something together that was valuable. In addition to that, our, listen, let me tell you what, and I've said this about her in private and to her in private rather than about her in public, and I just want to put it out there. <laughs> Woo, listen, my wife could already cook. Uh, I'm a well-fed man, but she has just taken it to new heights. I, I, I summarize it like this. I have been around the world so far as cuisine is concerned, and I haven't left my 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 home to do it. And I love traveling, literally traveling. We love international travel, domestic travel, haven't been able to do it as much as we like, but man, she's been able to fill the atmosphere with some wonderful smells, Spanish food, Mexican food, Asian food, South African food. Uh, I mean, we've just been, been around the world with amazing food. And I'm so grateful, so grateful, so grateful. Eating all that food though, uh, it's not good if we don't have any kind of exercise practice. And so we've been able to transform our living room, which serves as podcast recording studio, preaching and sanctuary space, and also in-home gym. This very space is, is multi-purpose now. We've been able to add different items to our home gym and take part in some home workouts. I must give a shout out to our coaches out West. If you've been tracking with us, you know I interviewed them last year for season one of the Living Room Podcast, Juice and Toya. Go follow their YouTube page, check them out, as well as One Body LA on Instagram. You won't regret it. They didn't pay me nor ask me for that plug. We've benefited from their work and their efforts, and we want to share it with you as well. So there have been some personal milestones reading, exercising, eating. Those are just a few. Communication, I can go on. But in addition to that, there have been some professional milestones. And that, the word that I'll use to summarize them for me is collaboration. Oh man, collaboration. I'll add another one, creativity and collaboration. You see, I've had kind of a growing interest in podcasting, in videography, in photography, in creating online spaces of learning and listening for a long time. But as a result of being in school and as a result of pastoring and other scheduling realities, A, I just didn't have all the time. But to be honest, in addition to that, I was not always using time that I did have 
to really lean into learning these things. Even when things broke, even when the pandemic happened, I did not just jump on every wave right away. You want to know how we started going online? I opened up my computer, went to Facebook, pressed Facebook Live, typed a little status and started preaching. Had a little prayer and preached, right? Didn't have a platform like Zoom or StreamYard to stream through at the time. Just opened my computer and went. Based on how I saw myself, I thought that I was, man, <laughs> as clear as day on the other end. It wasn't until I think the second or third week in where one of the members said, Pastor, we can hear you clearly. But man, your visual, your video is, is horrible, basically. And so I went back and watched one of the services, which I wasn't doing. I was just after I would go live, press end and go about the rest of the day. Went back and watched the video and it was video, video quality was very, very low. So since then, we've been able to add to our equipment. Right now, I'm using a Canon Rebel T6 with a 50 millimeter lens on there. And I'm recording on StreamYard. I'll edit in iMovie and post to YouTube. All of these things came over time. In fact, it was it was my wife's gentle encouragement that finally gave me the last little uh, courage and nudge to launch the podcast and launch some other social media endeavors that we're doing for the purposes of inspiring and adding to your life. And so as I think about it, what has helped personally and professionally is collaboration. Now, we've been able to collaborate with other churches online. One of the most meaningful was the last Saturday of 2020, my parents' church in Ohio and my church here were merged together virtually using StreamYard. It was an amazing experience, something that we planned for, and I'm glad we were able to lift off. At the start of this year, I was able to, and this is how it comes full circle. I told you a year ago, a few days ago, a year ago, a year, a year since this past weekend, I'll put it like that, um, was our last time in service. We were launching our annual March Gladness series. And one of my one of my big brothers in ministry, one of my colleagues came to preach for us. Well, we actually now collaborate with his church. And we started first Saturday, first Sabbath of January. We started collaborating together. His church is new life, my church is new life, and we worship together every weekend. And we've been able to partner churches in life groups, small groups that add to our faith experience. Living in faith every day is what that acronym stands for, L-I-F-E. And so collaboration has added joy. It has allowed the weight of, of responsibility to be shared. And we've been able to delegate amongst our leaders and our parishioners. That has added value so far as being able to pull our resources and our heads together to brainstorm meaningful teaching and preaching series, and also be able to think about what else can we do to add value to the lives of others. And last year, we had several opportunities, my church that is, to collaborate with other churches. I was able to speak virtually at different places around the nation and the world. And I had other people come and speak with me. Man, this thing has not been all bad and I appreciate it. And so I was talking to my wife and I asked her, you know, wouldn't it be great if we were able to hear just what blessings people have received and lessons they've learned? In other words, we often hear and a lot of it about, and I'm not, I'm being sensitive to this, you know, people losing their lives, um, losing employment, school being different for kindergartners all the way to college and graduate students. We understand that it's been a challenge, but in the midst of the challenge, there have also been some, some milestones. So I want you to drop it in the comments. What milestones have you experienced? Have you achieved? And what milestones are you celebrating from this entire year? It could be one. It could be several. I want to hear from you. Share them in the comments. Man, 200,000 mile milestone. A milestone in one year of being outside of the church building. It's been a personal blessing because it's added value to our home. There have been professional lessons learned, the value of collaboration and creativity. And as I think just in my, in my own time about what's next, I kind of want to think out loud with you. I do think that one thing we're going to have to think about when it comes to going back to church is I want us not to lose the value of having an online presence. Now, hear me when I say I don't simply mean just having a website or even just having a Facebook account or an Instagram page, but I'm thinking about now the intentionality that goes behind 
not losing all that we have gained and gleaned from this season that we've been in. That is to say, we have learned that the mission really can go forward when the gathered church is in a scattered iteration. So that when the two kind of come back together, I think that there, there is great a great deal of good that will be done if we do not haphazardly seek to just get back into a church building in hopes that everything online will remain the same. I think there needs to be strategy. I think there needs to be uh, intentionality to use one of the words one of my elders loves to use, and I, and I like it too, intentionality. But I also think there needs to be experimentation. Here's what I mean by that. And I'm not going to base this on church size only. I think that we ought to experiment with entire churches simply being online. I think that there is a population that has really given us the opportunity to kind of peek into their hearts. And I don't think it's limited to age either. I think experiences in life have a lot to do with it. Yes, there might be some generational aspect to it as well. But I think that a certain audience of people have given us have given us a peek into their hearts to say we are open to not only inspiration, but the transformational power that is the gospel on Instagram, using TikTok, on YouTube and Facebook. We are open to not just receiving these messages on Saturdays or Sundays, but hey, it can be in the morning on any day of the week at noon. It can be in the evening. It can even be at midnight. People are open. And so in our quest and in our planning to reintegrate the space that is a church building, which I think has a place, I do not want us to just breathe a sigh of relief and exhale a shout of, of celebration to be back in the building, which is not going to be exactly what we had before COVID. But I also think that this online space Man, there's there's a lot more that we can invest in. I know for my church, we intend to do that because whereas we had an online presence so far as having a website that indicated what goes on in the building, we had not yet gotten to the point where we were streaming online. So now we have a fairly significant viewership and participation pool such that I think we would do well to keep connected. So we've invested, it's already voted, not only in equipment, but now we're thinking strategy. What is it actually going to look like? How do we minister to those who are in the building and who are part of our virtual congregation? I think these are things that churches need to think about. Now, further to this idea of entire churches being online, that is a church that is online, that has meaningful offerings that are not limited to a building, but it is completely online. The opportunity that is there I don't even think we've begun to imagine what that looks like. Let me not say that. Let me not say that. I think we have begun to imagine it, but I think we need, this is opportune time to go beyond imagination to experimentation, to implementation and reflection. I'm not saying it's going to be right the first time we do it. And there have been persons who are right now, they have planted online churches. I think of buddies of mine, Recharge Worship out of Mississippi. I've got friends, North Carolina Online Worship out of North Carolina. There are persons who have planted online churches, and yet even some of those will be connected to buildings once buildings open up again. I think that we will need to experiment with building less, if I can, if I can say that word, expressions of church. And to now redefine what it means to come in contact with people, what are our touch points going to be like? What is our mission going to be like? How do we measure, quote unquote, success, forward progress? What does it mean? Now, I was talking to a buddy of mine about this, and I said, the entire access around which pastoral ministry revolved has kind of changed in this way. A large part of what I do depends on knowledge, okay? Okay, knowing, answering questions, providing answers. In the sense that, one, preaching, you're raising questions and you're seeking to answer them from the word of God, from the scriptures. When people come and they ask you something as simple as what's coming next, you, you have an answer. Vision casting, showing the way forward. Man, what this thing has done, it has really challenged faith leaders in the area of how do you lead when you don't have answers to every question? We are leading through what, for all intents and purposes, has been a great mystery. And there's still yet to be told about what comes next. 
And so even as I'm thinking out loud, it is not me thinking as if I have the definitive answer. I'm simply presenting one potential idea in response to both opportunities and the unknown. So again, I want you to comment. What can church look like in your context going forward? It might look like going back into the buildings because you now have more space and you are able to serve your community better there. But what do you think about this online expression of church? And what can it look like as it evolves and gets better? What has ministered to you? What's been valuable to you? I want you to let me know. Those are two milestones I wanted to share with you today and just chop it, a little, chop it up a little bit with you. I want to share with you just how proud and happy I am to be driving a car that is still working beyond 200,000 miles. And I want to think out loud and reflect a little bit about being out of our church building for a year. It's been challenging, but it's also come with blessings and lessons. Listen, that's all we have for this episode of The Living Room. I'm so glad that you spent some time with me today. I'm looking forward to next week already. We have a special guest coming. You don't want to miss it. Go out and check out some of our other episodes. Be inspired. And until our next time, continue to listen, continue to learn, and continue to live.